Oh, and welcome. My name is Chris Osborne, Editor-in-Chief of Defense Systems. We are very glad you are all here. We'd like to welcome you to a cutting-edge and interesting webcast today and thank our sponsor, Pivot3. The title of the webcast is Pivot3 Next-Gen Hyper-Converged Platform. Without question, a cutting-edge topic that's receiving a lot of attention today. The focus today is the quick evolution or trajectory from software-defined and virtualization practices to, indeed, hyperconvergence that adapts to an increased data flow as processing speed gets faster. But certainly, by any estimation, we have experts here whose expertise far exceeds my own. We've got a great lineup, a powerhouse group of players to address these topics. Let me quickly let you know who we have here. One of them is Jeff Forte. He's the Vice President of Federal at Pivot3. He's a leading business solutions for intelligence, defense agencies, and civilian agencies as well. He came to Pivot3 from VMware and has an impressive background, not the least of which, of course, being a U.S. Marine, a retired lieutenant colonel. He has a master's of science in computer science and as well a master's of science in IT management from the Naval Postgraduate School, and he is a graduate of the prestigious Naval Academy. We also have Jim Smith. He's the chief technology advisor at Iron Bow. He has over 20 years' experience implementing and managing IT infrastructures from commercial and government spaces. He's been a director of development responsible for building and the deployment of data centers. Prior to Iron Bow, he managed a team of engineers for EMC, working with the Army and DOD to design and deploy virtualization, storage infrastructure, security data management. Eric Oberhofer is also here. He's the federal CTO from Pivot3. He serves as he spent over 15 years of IT infrastructure and management expertise in the public and private sectors. He worked at Iron Bow prior to joining Pivot3, where he was managing director for cloud services. Cloud, of course, very key with all of this. He's received a Master's of Science from George Washington University and a Bachelor of Science. He lives in Delray Beach, Florida, where it's always sunny and fun. They'll bring, they'll bring all kinds of interesting things. We encourage you to ask questions. We, of course, thank our sponsors. All three of these super experts have addressed the, the evolution or trajectory toward hyperconvergence as it embraces next generation technologies, of course, working to respond to increased data flow and flexing as need be. So certainly before we get started, however, I'd like to cover a couple housekeeping items. First, if you'd like to enlarge your slides, look for the square icon in the top right corner of the slide window. You can also view the presentation in full screen mode by clicking the squared arrows icon. Also, at any time during the next hour, if you'd like to submit a question, please, we want to hear from you and what you're thinking. Just look for the question field into the left of the slide window, type in your question there, hit submit. We'll field your question at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical difficulties during the session, look for the yellow question mark icon during the slide window, click there, and you will receive technical assistance. If you'd like to download a copy of today's presentation, just look for the Resource Center just below the question field. Finally, I want to let you know in the next day or two, we'll email you a link to the archived version of the session so you can view it again or share it with a colleague. Thank you all. A special thanks to our experts. And now let's start with the first one and hand it over to Jim Smith. Great. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. So as Chris mentioned, I'm CTO of Iron Boat Technologies. And as such, uh, we do um, quite a bit of business with uh, both commercial and with government entities and have uh, a lot of uh, expertise and looking at different emerging technologies and partners. So very happy to uh, be here today and to uh, be able to talk about not only hyperconvergence but about Pivot3 um, in particular. So as the uh, Department of Defense, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, with you and, and with looking at what the mission is. and it's important, I think, to really look at what's happening. And it's really a shift from being a focus on technology to what's important with your application, what kind of data is out there, and how can that affect your mission? How do I put systems out there that are flexible, they're agile, and I'm not spending my time worrying about how do I keep these up, how do I have the capacity or the capabilities to do what I need to do, but to really make sure you can focus on the mission. That comes into a play with a lot of the data center consolidation, the optimization plays that you're familiar with. You know, how do I move my entire uh, environment to a more cloud-like type infrastructure? How do I optimize it? Um, that means how do I minimize my costs? How do I make 
uh, power, cooling, environmental stuff, less expensive, how do I do more uh, with less? And finally, that agility, I think, is being able to take and move things out to the tactical edge. So that's always been important, I think, for, um, for DOD uh, customers and for a lot of our customers in particular. Uh, there's so many new sensors and no, more capabilities in terms of producing data, and how do you get real actionable mission type of intelligence uh, so I can do things with that. And part of that is being able to push compute power and, and analytics out to the edge, and how do I also then have that communicate seamlessly with uh, the rest of my environment. And uh, all these pieces really kind of play into what we're going to be talking about a little bit more today, and we'll get into uh, some more details. So <clears throat> this is just a more general slide, I think, talking about how not only uh, is this important for the DoD, but it's what we're seeing across the entire industry. And it's, it's how do I do more with less? How do I get this infrastructure more cost effective? How do I deal with this explosive growth with data capacity, uh, the, the additional sensors and kind of the Internet of Things, all of these pieces that are generating more and more data, some of this unstructured data that I haven't had to deal with in the past. So how do I normalize that? How do I put it into a place that I can look at it? And what kind of technologies can I use that are really going to benefit me and allow me, again, to, uh, to focus on, on what the mission is. So hopefully these slides are, are showing up for you as well. Um, this has been, and Chris kind of uh, alluded to this, it's been a push towards um, software and, and software-defined, and we're going to talk about that just real briefly because software-defined, I think, is this move away from hardware specific and the idea of application specific integrated circuits, ASICs, where I have hardware that is hard coded to do only a very specific thing. And it's about having much more intelligent software. And that intelligent software uh, allows me to use my, my data infrastructure more efficiently, more effectively. It means you've got these management uh, uh, capabilities where you have centralized, consistent management. And that plays through the entire ecosystem, giving you enhanced security capabilities, reduced risk, giving you that kind of cloud enablement and the agility to have the different pieces that you have work in any way that you would like them to. So I'm bringing all this up because I think hyperconverged infrastructure, it's become so hot because it's a great instantiation of what we're talking about there. And it's about um, how do you get all that agility put into place? Uh, and I was very happy that uh, we work with Pivot3 uh, quite a bit and um, love the infrastructure, love the technology, and want to have uh, – Jeff is going to talk a little bit more about the overall hyperconverged piece, and we'll turn it over to Eric Oberhoff, who's going to get into more specifics around Pivot3 and, and a little bit more on the technical side. So with that, I will hand things over to Jeff and uh, appreciate your time. Hey, thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Um, what I'm going to do for the next few slides is I'm going to give a perspective on both first-generation HCI and what we are calling next-generation HCI. But before I do that, I want to just make sure I level set um, the audience on what is hyperconverted infra infrastructure. I'm assuming that most everybody that joined this understands that, but I'm going to spend 20 seconds on this. So hyperconverged infrastructure is the, really the abstracting and combining of the three silos that you find in a data center infrastructure, those silos being compute or servers, storage, and then the networks, both storage and application that tie those pieces together. And those are abstracted in software and then deployed on a commodity server. Could be an HP, Supermicro, uh, or Dell. Um, so that, that, that is hyperconverged infrastructure as a definition. So the things that Jim highlighted, what is needed in the DOD or really across um, all IT infrastructures, the hyperconverged infrastructure actually is a great next step, but the first generation really it addressed some of those things from a um, 
you know, from a modularity and scalability perspective, it certainly brought economics um, from a costing and, and only deploying what you need as you need it. And then also it, it addressed the simplicity. Certainly the first generation infrastructures that are out there um, are simple and they have a great, you know, management in place to, to make all that infrastructure operate. But what really is, was lacking in the first generation was that most of those first generation were used and leveraged at targeted workloads, and you know, such as VDI or maybe a small web infrastructure. And some of the reason because of that or the reasoning for that was some, in some cases it was performance, some it was scalability, um, or it didn't fit into the infrastructure because it required uh, everything to be virtualized. So what we're calling the next gen uh, HCI, it has some requirements. And I'm showing a slide right now that has those requirements. Some of them are the, are the same, you know, simple management, uh, efficient resource utilization, scalability. But there's the last two really we're calling extensive data services and consistent performance. One of the things that was lacking in the first generation was being able to put mixed workloads together out in that infrastructure and make sure that, uh, you know, this high-performance database that's running production workloads could be uh, performance isolated from, say, the DevOps workload. And how could you guarantee uh, that you get the performance that you need in those? Um, also, you know, next we'll see that's going to come in the form of quality of service um, for us. But those are the things that you need in a next generation hyperconverged platform. So what I'd like to do now is explain to you that we use those principles, those things that we saw missing in that first generation, and we use those as the basis for our development of our latest um, recently announced Acuity platform, which uh, was basically using our base platform plus some integrations from an acquisition we made last year. So the real value points are here on your screen. So Eric's going to cover these from a technical perspective, but I'm just going to set them up here. Um, so if you're going to be a platform that is able to support all types of workloads, the high-end database, analytics, uh, and not just the VDI and web services, you have to have that performance. And through our architecture and uh, some of the capabilities that we've added, um, you will see how we are able to deliver two to sometimes eight, eight times the performance of the existing platforms out there today. Um, efficiency, that's something that's always been native to Pivot 3. We just build on that in the Acuity platform. And then you'll see, again, because of our architecture, the way that we scale um, and how we can fit into an existing environment, um, both virtual and physical, is unique um, to the industry. I've got two more value points that I've put down there, and these are really derived from the, the architecture and um, the, the capabilities that we have. One being the content agnostic storage. Certainly our DOD customers, you have many things that are non-data that's in a non-compressible form uh, or it's already been compressed as much as it can, that being video, encrypted data, other sensor data. For Eric will explain that we handle that data the same way we do other data. Um, so we're giving you that efficient um, capacity utilization. And then the other one that is really is what we call swap, space, weight, and power. Certainly when you start getting to the tactical edge, that becomes critical, whether you're deploying on a ship or in the back of a Humvee. But it's also obviously uh, pertinent to the data center because those are also cost drivers as well. So that's really just the summary of the value points. Eric's now going to jump in and click down on each one of those topics in order um, at this point. Eric? 
Thanks a lot, Jeff. So I wanted to talk about um, kind of the conventional um, architectures that a lot of the other players are, um, are, have built their HCI platforms on. Um, and I want to define it when I say an HCI node, um, kind of use it synonymously with an x86 server, um, an appliance. Um, it, you know, it's delivered in that kind of a building block uh, mentality. So uh, a lot of the other players out there, um, when they created their architectures for HCI, um, what they did is that they actually started at the hypervisor layer. So for instance, they took um, VMware's ESXi hypervisor, and in order to make that work, they needed to uh, supply shared storage to that. So they took multiple HCI nodes, which are x86 servers. They have compute, RAM, and internal storage drives, either flash drives or spinning drives. And they wrap them together with a file system. So some of the limitations that we have seen from that um, is that you can actually have what we could call either islands or silos of resources. So if you have a virtual ma machine residing on one of the physical HCI nodes, that virtual machine will only ever get the maximum amount of resources um, from that one HCI node. So whatever storage um, performance is in that one node from the drives, you'll never be able to exceed that. Um, additionally, uh, your, the, a virtual machine will only be able to access a volume um, that is on the drives local to that machine. So you, you can't expand your volume to be incredibly large. The other problem with the file system-based approach that we have seen is that in order to protect the data, they either use data mirroring or you can call it data replication between the nodes. So when a write comes in, it is written to one of the nodes and then it is copied two to three other times depending on your um, high availability requirements. Uh, most enterprise workloads do require three copies of the data. So inherently you're taking up a lot more storage because you have the, you know, the same object written three times. In order to kind of uh, reduce the overall amount of storage, the companies will employ data deduplication or compression technologies to either inline or post-process reduce that data, um, thus freeing up more free space. The problem with that is um, in the traditional architecture where your SAN or your NAS was completely separate from your servers, you could take those storage processors and run them all the way up to 99% running um, deduplication, uh, compression, or other data management processes, and you're not affecting your overall server virtual machines or virtual desktop. But as you consolidate your SAN now into a virtual storage um, controller on one of your HCI nodes, if you're running 30 to 40% of that CPU running data services, you're going to run into problems where you're stealing resources from the CPU to be able to run virtual machines or virtual desktops. So we've seen where you could have extremely high CPU overhead running the data management processes, thus limiting your uh, scalability as you add more nodes together inside of a cluster. At Pivot3, we um, completely uh, kind of flipped the way that a design happens from our HCI, and we think that we are the architecture leader from a hyper-converged perspective. Um, our company was founded 14 years ago, and we focused on creating a virtual block level SAN uh, from the get-go. So we focused on the storage portion, which is the more difficult portion, and then we added a hypervisor on top to take advantage of this um, extra CPU cycles, and therefore allowing us to run virtual machines and virtual desktops on top of that. So we take all of the drives in all of our nodes and aggregate them together and create one massive array where we're able to um, stripe across those using our um, patented scalar erasure coding. Um, erasure coding, it's a, in our eighth generation of this code. Um, we write natively with that in line, and it is um, a more advanced way to um, efficiently write data as well as protect data as opposed to your traditional RAID 5, RAID 6 that you might be more familiar with. Um, so being a block level iSCSI SAN gives us a lot of uh, flexibility in how we can scale um, from a performance perspective 
and um, just in the overall design uh, compared to a file system based um, mirroring and data replication approach. We write the data once and we don't have to copy it to multiple different nodes. Um, as Jeff mentioned earlier, um, we architected our latest release of what we call our Acuity um, platform. We completely rewrote the data path using an all NVMe uh, PCIe flash um, data path. We still have the ability to use different types of backing storage, so either uh, flash SSDs or higher capacity spinning hard drives, uh, depending on your requirements. But what this does is it allows us to be able to um, provide sub-millisecond latencies for your highest mission-critical type workloads. Um, on top of that, on top of the PCIe or the NVMe uh, PCIe flash, which gives us significantly faster um, uh, uh, millisecond latencies um, than a traditional SATA or SAS backplane, we coupled that with our uh, Pivot3 storage quality of service. This is completely unique, um, and this is the first for any HCI vendor, as well as a lot of SAN vendors um, out there. Our quality of service is extremely uh, granular um, from a performance perspective, so we can do this um, you know, at the VVOL level, and we're able to do this instantaneously, so it is not something that you mark a volume or you mark something, and then later on in the day or at night, it is moved up into hot storage. As soon as, um, you know, it, as soon as the data is being marked hot, it is moved up. So we're able to uh, guarantee mins and maxes, both on from a latency and bandwidth perspective. Uh, another part that is different from with our quality of service from the storage perspective is that we're actually able to tie data management functions into that. So not only have a QoS for the performance, but we can say, hey, for a mission critical workload, I'm going to prioritize when that takes snapshots, when that does clones, as well as when you want to do any type of asynchronous replication um, across the LAN to another Pivot3 cluster that is out there. So what we're doing is that moving into more of a policy-based approach for managing your workloads. Uh, we truly believe with this next generation of our Acuity um, hyperconverged that there are no x86 workloads that cannot be virtualized all on the same platform, managed um, by the same tools, but through um, logical policies separate these workloads. Um, so we're now getting to a stack where we can have storage QoS, compute QoS provided by VMware, and software-defined networking QoS uh, through a variety of networking providers that are out there. I want to show that you know, this is it's a very simple wizard-based approach on how we're able to apply policies to uh, volumes. Um, you, that we have five different types of um, mission, or five different types of policies ranging from mission critical all the way down to the test dev. Um, you know, a, we have a web-based vCenter plugin where VMware administrators can go in, uh, click a few boxes on a wizard, and be able to deploy storage automatically, and it will refresh and present this as a data store within their uh, vCenter admin console. Beyond the performance, we wanted to make sure that we were extremely efficient um, in the way that we present our, not only our storage, so the usable storage back to the user, as well as the overall CPU cycles that are able to be utilized as virtual machines. So just want to explain this graph that we have out there. Um, on the left-hand side going up, you will see the storage efficiency percentages going from zero all the way to 100%. And when I say storage efficiency, um, this is the percent of usable storage that we're presenting back to you. And then on the, the x-axis is the number of appliances that are in a cluster. So at the top, you will see the orange um, arcing line as the pivot three line. And at, uh, we have an algorithmic predictive um, ability with our erasure coding that at three nodes, in an, um, or three appliances in within our cluster will always have 66% of usable storage back to the user. 
as we start growing and adding more nodes, therefore we're adding overall more performance as well as more capacity because we're aggregating more drives and writing across all the drives within our underlying SAN, um, we're increasing the overall usable capacity uh, to the user all the way up to you know, 94%, which is even unheard of in the traditional SAN and NAS uh, space. Below that, you'll actually see two flat lines. One, um, and these are some of the other players in the HCI space, the line that says 50% um, that is going all the way across, that is an HCI vendor that is implementing two copies, uh, two mirrors of the data within their clusters. And the 33% the line is three copies of the data uh, from, a, a perform, or from a data protection perspective. You will notice that when Pivot 3 adds more appliances, we become more storage efficient, offering up more storage. When the other players add more nodes because they're a file system based approach, their storage efficiency never increases because they're not sharing storage uh, like Pivot 3 is across the individual nodes in their clusters. So what this means to you is more usable storage for you, less required hardware to meet your usable storage, um, thus lowering your overall cost, your rack space, and just you know, managing less uh, appliances and less hardware. Um, a corollary to that is I need to be very uh, compute efficient as well because um, if you're not compute efficient, like I mentioned some of the other players, uh, where they're utilizing 30 to 40 percent of their CPUs to run data services that, you know, the, the compression, the data deduplication to gain back some usable storage, um, it, it is stealing resources from virtual machines out there. Therefore, you're not able to scale because you run into CPU contention issues as you add more user or as you add more nodes to your cluster. With Pivot 3 being um, inherently efficient in the way that it stores data, our CPU overhead is significantly lower. Um, we are roughly about 8% overhead from a CPU perspective, and then as we add more nodes, it actually goes down to about 6% of overhead, thus giving you almost 90% of the CPU to be able to run your virtual machines, your virtual desktops. Um, once again, this means less, uh, you know, we're very dense. Um, we, you know, there's less hardware that is required to be procured to meet your requirements. Um, as you, you know, I already mentioned, you know, as you're adding um, your SAN and your uh, virtual and your servers together, you need to make sure that everything is very highly available and resilient because, uh, you know, it's going to be running enterprise workloads. We have the ability to be able to have five drive failures simultaneously and still have um, no data unavailability. We can also lose one complete server or one complete node plus two additional drives at all the same time and still be, have uptime um, with no data unavailability. So we've designed this with no single points of failure. Um, we actually are six nines of availability, which equates to about 24.5 minutes of unplanned downtime a year. So uh, built with um, HA in mind. I want to talk about our scaling now, which is very unique um, compared to some of the other players out there. Um, I think this is a, a major design um, perspective that when we talk with customers, particularly in the DOD, um, this is an area where they kind of, you know, the, the eyes light up and they really understand how they can start playing with this. Um, you know, it's, uh, my wife always says, you know, what are you actually doing? What are you, what are you selling? What are you doing out there? And I say, I just, I'm basically building Lego, Lego blocks for you know, DOD data centers to kind of put together. Uh, they get to choose whether they're compute heavy, data heavy, or mixed workloads. So because we are an iSCSI block level SAN, it gives us the ability to present iSCSI storage to all of the nodes within our cluster, as well as being able to present that externally to any type of server that's out there. Um, so not only are we allowed to, able to linearly um, scale, and, and which is very predictable from a capacity um, and efficiency perspective, but also from a performance perspective, um, 
Uh, but everything is always online when we're adding new nodes. So what, we're what we did here was we, um, we were taking the actual resources within each node of an HCI cluster and are uh, separating them out, you know, splitting the compute from the storage and being able to scale them independently. Um, that is very different from some of the other folks where once you pick a, uh, a node size that has a particular size of drives in it, every time you want to increase that cluster, the node has to be the exact same. We do not have that limitation. So I wanted to go through just a couple examples of that um, where these are, you know, real-world examples. So we had some customers that just started off small. They wanted to go with, you know, in this instance, three nodes um, within an HCI cluster, all flash storage. They decided that, hey, um, I've met my storage performance from an IOPS perspective, and I also have enough capacity. So I, there's no reason for me to add more storage because it's an extra cost that I don't need to have. But I do need to add more resources I mean, from a compute and RAM perspective. Um, we see this often in a VDI deployment. So in this example, we can go ahead and add Pivot3 compute nodes, map them still into the same uh, storage pool from the original, and we're able to increase the overall ESXi cluster size, thus adding more compute and RAM. So very flexible. Uh, once again, you know, only add the resources where you need to, thus lo lowering your overall cost. Um, another example, uh, kind of the inverse of this one is, let's go back to where we have three nodes, all flash storage. The compute and RAM, there is plenty of that. Uh, you do not need to add any more. But running out of either storage performance from an IOPS perspective, or you need to add more capacity. What we can do is add our bare metal nodes, so these are our data nodes, um, and they will, expand, they will actually expand the existing uh, storage pool. Um, we're able to do this online and rebalance the data across all seven nodes as opposed to the three. So now any virtual machine within that ESXi cluster is able to access all the drives in all the nodes across seven of them, thus higher performance and higher capacity um, as opposed to just the three previously. The other advantage to this is because we're able to deploy them as bare metal nodes with you know, minimal processors, minimal RAM, just enough to run the storage, pro um, storage processors, we do not have to include a hypervisor which o uh, lowers the overall cost. But just because there's not a hypervisor does not mean that we, we don't manage them the same way we still manage them through the vCenter web plugin um, that is included. Um, so what we'll actually see here is just because of, uh, the previous examples were expanding out flash storage, we can also have different pools of storage. So in this example, we have three nodes that are all flash storage from uh, an HCI perspective and they have a hypervisor on there running ESXi and there's virtual machines. Those virtual machines are also able to access four bare metal only data nodes that are providing what we call hybrid and that is the um, higher capacity spinning drive. So in this example, uh, this is also another VDI example where a virtual machine is its gold image and the uh, link clones are all running on faster flash um, to be able to provide uh, fast storage for the operating system. But their SIF share, which is, you know, their D share, their user share, where they have their user files, uh, it is more cost effective to run them on a, um, a hybrid node where it's the higher capacity spinning drive. So we've actually done, um, you know, it was a DOD agency where it was, they had a traditional architecture of Dell servers, NetApp storage, and they were looking at, um, they, they really uh, liked our HCI. Um, they did a proof of concept and ultimately um, we were able to win. And what they did was a complete data center refresh where they had um, ESXi hosts all uh, clustered together uh, from a vSphere perspective. 
and they had multiple pools of data, uh, so flash storage as well as hybrid storage, and virtual machines were seamlessly able to access any of the pools of storage that are available out there. Um, and I just want to reiterate that because we are that iSCSI block level storage um, from a hyperconverged perspective, um, we are not creating a, another silo where your data either goes in and you can never get it out. Um, what we want to be able to do is provide an, uh, an IT environment for you, for a common platform for multiple applications that can either utilize existing storage, so any of the virtual machines that are running on Pivot 3 hyperconverged appliances can access existing storage in your environment as long as there's network connectivity. But more importantly, we're able to extend out our hyperconverged SAN to any existing or external servers that you may have. These can be Windows servers with Hyper-V, ESXi servers. Um, we've had a lot of DoD customers where they have servers that just cannot be virtualized, be it their weapon systems or their Unix boxes or something like that. We're able to provide Pivot3 storage to those servers. Um, and what that does is it reduces the need to buy an external SAN just to support those workloads that, are un, uh, that you're not able to virtualize. Um, I mentioned it before, but I wanted to just go over it more. From a management perspective, we wanted to make it as easy as possible for VMware administrators. So we did not create a brand new um, external management interface. Um, we are using a vSphere web client plugin. So any VMware administrator that is familiar with vCenter server, they can go in um, through the web client and be able to manage, mo uh, modify, and you know, monitor the performance of any and all um, Pivot3 appliances. As long as there's network connectivity, you can manage um, appliances across sites or multiple clusters um, that are uh, together. Um, what we see on a typical basis, though, is that you're not often adding or removing nodes or creating new volumes and LUNs. So um, we see VMware administrators creating the LUNs, and then automatically vCenter will present those as data stores, and they'll be off using traditional vCenter tools to you know, manage their virtual machines. But the, the, the tool and the plugin is there, and it's, it's very easy. Um, Jeff, I wanted to hand it back to you and just talk about some of the use cases that we're seeing for the, the Pivot3 platform. Thanks, Eric. I'm sorry I had a moment getting off mute there. Um, great. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, and just as a really a, um, you know, a summary to kind of loop back from uh, at least from the technical piece, uh, with the increased performance, I mean, uh, sub-millisecond latencies, um, the efficiency that we always had, uh, and the scalability, meaning to also, you know, to not just plop into a virtual environment, but also to be able to su support physical workloads that need to remain physical, and mounting our, you know, high-performance, hyper-converged array, it gives us the flexibility to act as that common platform in a data center and even at the tactical edge. So the things that we're doing with customers, some you know, are, are new projects because of Acuity's release um, recently, but um, doing things on, in deployable nodes, tactical edge, um, doing some multi-tenant private cloud type things with um, some of our partners, VMware and Hytrust, uh, working with NVIDIA, putting GPUs in, and um, some of those are new projects that, you know, folks want to do some interesting things with analytics. So the platform, because of that quality of service and the increased performance being driven by the MVME, um, really allows us to position Acuity as a data center platform, not just the targeted apps like the first generation did. So, um, you know, we've done several briefs with some of the DOD uh, agencies and, and actually some of the foreign militaries, and they were really impressed with the – or excited about leveraging this type of a platform because 
back to what Jim had brought up is, you know, they're focused on apps and data, you know, that drive the mission. And they don't want to spend a lot of time building different architectures for different solution sets, whether it's in the data center, you know, maybe it's a tactical processing, processing node medium versus what they're putting at the edge. So I, I think we've come, you know, come full circle and be able to deliver on that multi um, use case platform. So Jim, I'm, I'm sure you could probably tie in a few more things here at a higher level. Um, I turn it over to you. Excellent, thanks, Jeff. So uh, appreciate that, and I think it's a, a you know HCI is something you're hearing a lot about, and uh, you know, it's a crowded marketplace. So I, I think what was great, Eric and Jeff, is just kind of differentiate. I think what makes you guys unique, and what makes the uh, solution you know a really a really viable solution. I think in the uh, in the DoD space, uh, you know, it is really about how do you focus on that mission. And the mission really means everything, and you want to spend more time focused on that and less time thinking about your your infrastructure. And you know, scalability I think has always been one of the uh, kind of Achilles' heels of what some of the architectures are with um, with HCI and, and why some uh, instantiations of that have not gone well after they've progressed from their initial um, kind of proof of concept or small missions. Uh, and, and you see that's a real differentiator, I think, for Pivot 3 and, and how they handle that. And, um, very unique, I think, in, the, uh, in that, um, that offering that they have put together. It's flexible. It's scalable. Um, you know, it's easy to manage. You can focus on, as, as Jeff just brought up again, your applications and data. I mean, really, you don't want to think about what the architecture is. You want to think about what the data is, what kind of information can I get out of that, how do I make real-time decisions using some of that data, and how do I make sure my applications all work well, perform well, and have that data readily available. Uh, moving analytics out into the tactical environment, uh, everything, since we're producing more and more data, it's becoming more and more critical that I have the assets that I require out in the field so that I can get real-time information off of that data being generated, and I can send what's important or pertinent back to uh, the home base to let them know and how to make decisions on those kinds of things. Cost efficient and um, you know how do I really have all of that put together in a, a single package? So uh, I think you guys did a great job of kind of summarizing some of that and, and shedding some light, I think, on what some of the differentiators were for uh, for Pivot Three in the uh, in the HCI space. So that's uh, that's it for me. I know that we're going to open it up for some questions and some other things and. Um, I'll turn it back over. Excellent. Thank you very much. A thought-provoking conversation, to be sure. We want to encourage you to send your questions, engage these experts with whatever you might have. It might hopefully humbly be relevant to quickly mention a couple things. The kind of cutting-edge technologies they're addressing has a ubiquitous and significant impact, as many know, on military platforms. They talked about reducing the server footprint and the hardware footprint. WinT, for example, Warfighter Information Network Tactical, can now be condensed to the point that it integrates into the back of a Humvee and can be airdropped. Of course, many track how command and control for missile defense is now much smaller, more condensed in terms of data consolidation. And they talked about real-time information flow and flexing to increase a higher volume. Well, something like artificial intelligence is already helping striker vehicles with condition-based maintenance. They can more quickly access key information relevant to the functioning of vehicles. All of this are stuff these experts, of course, contribute to in many ways and are following in a very detailed way. And so with that in mind, and I'd like to open this up to questions. There is a tremendous impact from all this technology they're talking about. We welcome you to submit your questions. Why don't we begin with one question here, which says, what type of application environments does Pivot 3 support? So this is Eric. I'll take that one. And then uh, Jeff, Jim, if you want, you guys can jump in and do some color commentary. Um, so the traditional sense of uh, HCI, you know, it was always HCI equals VDI. You know, kind of VDI was the de facto. So obviously, Pivot 3 can um, support uh, VDI. Um, we're very good at that, and we have lots of use cases and, you know, reference architectures, you know, for designs. Um, I think with our latest acuity release, combining our NVMe flash performance with our storage QoS, 
there are no x86 workloads that we cannot run um, because we're able to logically separate them out and give the applications that are more mission critical, we can guarantee them the types of resources that they need um, so that way you don't run into kind of the noisy neighbor problem that a lot of other HCI vendors run into. Um, Jeff, uh, Jim, do you guys have any comments? Yeah, this is Jeff. I, I mean, just to make sure to, I, I don't know the exact nature of the question, but, uh, you know, we run the VMware hypervisor today. Hyper-V will be supported early next, or sometime next year um, from that perspective. And then uh, one other thing I would say is because we are, like I said, at our core, an iSCSI um, SAN at the bottom, you know, at the base, um, you know, let's say you have an Oracle Solaris system running and it needed storage, it certainly could mount our uh, array. So it doesn't necessarily have to be virtualized and sitting on top of our platform. Great. Let's move right to the next question for these experts. It is, is there anything special that I need to do for my applications to take advantage of NVMe Flash? Well, I guess these are all technical questions, so this is Eric again. I'll take it. Uh, no. So the NVMe in our uh, uh, HCI architecture uh, it is used for two things. One is used for read-write cache, so all application I.O. Uh, be, is able to utilize that, as well as we have a persistence tier where um, the hot applications are living within the NVMe. The only thing that I would recommend when you are creating new volumes to run your virtual machines on are use, utilize the wizard and be able to associate a different service level, you know, anywhere from mission critical all the way down to test dev, we have five of those, um, and, you know, set that so it's automatically associated with the correct resources. Um, that is all, you know, automatically done. Um, if at the, you know, after you deploy it and you determine that it's at the wrong level, you can um, modify the, 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 the level that it's at and it'll, you know, either go up or down. So the answer is no, but there's ways to optimize it. Excellent. Next question. Does Pivot 3 have reached into the SCADA SCADA big energy field, ideally with wellhead or HMI relay access supporting architecture? So uh, this is Jim Smith. Uh, I'll just jump in and uh, make sure I understand the question, first of all. So uh, SCADA, and there's obviously a lot of things that go into uh, smart buildings and some of the analytics and pieces like that. I'm not aware, and Pivot 3 guys can and uh, can jump in. I'm not aware of anything specific that's been done in terms of uh, working with some of those manufacturers to put things specifically onto Pivot 3 uh, architecture. But where we've seen, um, you know, things like uh, hyperconverge in general be a very good fit in SCADA type of deployment is where you're trying to get analytics out of it um, and you're using an analytics platform. Uh, just as I guess this ties into the first question of what applications can be deployed and, you know, really any x86 applications, plus the flexibility that Jeff talked about of being able to uh, present uh, storage out to other applications. So, you know, where you're looking to put things out into the field and potentially have smaller uh, instantiations of uh, hyperconverged infrastructure where you're doing analytics um, on-site for, uh, for SCADA or for whatever uh, you're, you're looking to do it with, um, it would be a great fit for that, that kind of a deployment. Great. Next one. How soon after I make a QoS cross policy change does the performance change? Uh, that's an easy one. That is instantaneously. Um, it is as soon as you make the policy change um, that it will be applied to the volume that that um, you know the virtual machines that are running in that volume. Um, we do not have the issue where you have to warm data up and it'll be you know moved in between tiers after several hours. Uh, um, it is an instantaneous change. Great. Quickly answered there. Do you support smart card authentication into your management platform? Yes. Yes, we do. This is Jeff, not the technical guy, but yes, we do. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Any further? Okay, great. Let's move right to the next one. Great answer. I have 
a VMware virtual environment and an Oracle Solaris physical environment, both sharing NetApp. My NetApp is EOL. Can I migrate to Pivot 3? Elaborate, please. Okay. I, I think I addressed that one earlier um, or a similar concept where if we have um, – I'd seen that question in advance um, while we were going through this. Um, yes, yes. What they would do is just mount, use an iSCSI mount to our array, and they would be joined to the storage network and be able to leverage our storage just like they would the NetApp. Great. This next question addresses the questions about storage, virtualization, and movement to the cloud, which, of course, the experts entertained at great length. It says, could I present that ISTE, IS? the SI storage to a virtual machine in guest. Eric? So, I, yeah, I think they were um, asking if they could present an iSCSI storage to a, in get, or a virtual machine in guest. Um, the answer is yes. So we can present our iSCSI SAN storage to a general host, or we could present it to a virtual machine, you know, like a, a, a Microsoft virtual machine, um, using the iSCSI initiator on that virtual machine as well. So we have that flexibility to do both ways. Great. So way, oh, I'm go ahead. Say, I just want to add it. So actually, Eric, is, I mean, is that what we've talked about in the past where somebody could really, we could be simultaneously supporting both the VMware and a Hyper-V environment? Is that where we go with that? Yeah, and not only that, you could have, an, you know, external storage from, uh, you know, somewhere else in that in your environment. So, you know, truly being able to provide a, a common platform to leverage existing assets out there. Well, you know, we're not looking to create another silo, or we're not looking, you know, to just rip and replace everything. Gotcha. Great. Does Pivot3 do something different with the NVMe Flash versus other vendors? Go ahead, Eric. <laughs> Didn't know I got them all. Okay. Um, yes. So what we have done from an HCI perspective is re-architected the entire data path. So we have removed the SATA connections that the, the hard drives and the, the SSDs are using um, and are using an NVMe path. So all of the data is being um, read-write cache through NVMe first, um, and then it will uh, backend out to the backing storage. So, yeah. Um, you know, NVMe is the first uh, place that the store, that any virtual machine or any host would hit, thus increasing the performance, the bandwidth, um, and significantly lowering the latency. You know, we're looking at sub-millisecond latencies, um, which is amazing for virtual desktops and, you know, mission-critical databases out there. Excellent. I want to thank the experts for their expertise and everyone for their time and questions and interest in these obviously cutting-edge topics. We're out of time right now, but that was, uh, without question, a very informative cutting-edge discussion. I want to thank Pivot3 for their sponsorship of this webcast. And finally, I can remind you, in the next day or two, we'll be emailing you a link to an archived version of the session so you can review it or pass it along to a colleague. Thank you very much for attending. We appreciate your expertise. That concludes today's webcast.